everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday refuel service. I hope you've had a wonderful week. We're here worshiping from our sanctuary at World Outreach Church for All Nations in Lawrenceville, Georgia. We're still observing all social um, distancing guidelines, and we hope you are too. I hope you've had a great week, a um, great week ahead. We thank God for this opportunity to come together as a family and just refresh ourselves in His Word, in His goodness, in music, in prayer as one. We thank you, Father, for who you are to us. We thank you for the great things you always do for us. We thank you because you love us. Say you've loved us with an everlasting love. Yes. And because of that, we're secure in who we are in you. We're secure that every need we have has been taken care of. We may not see the manifestation yet, but we know it is done. We're grateful for, to you, Father Lord. Thank you, because you said you know every hair on our head. You said that our times are in your hand. You said that you've given us abundantly more than we can ask or even fathom. I mean, what else do we need? We're so grateful to you, Father. We love you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for blessing us, for keeping us, for being our daddy. We're grateful to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're singing a new song. It's easy. It's call and response. And it's just thanking God for who he is in our life. Okay? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah.
loving kindness has embraced us and put a shield around us. You've kept us from harm. You've kept us from the devourment of the enemy. We're grateful to you, Father. We thank you, Father. We worship you, Lord. There is no one like you, Papa. We bless you, Father.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us exalt our King together. Father God, we just glorify you. We just give you the praise and we give you the honor. We thank you for just this opportunity to just be in your presence, to give you thanks, to praise your name, to glorify you, because you're truly an awesome God. And we just say thank you. Thank you for your son who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, gave his life that we may be able to be accepted into your kingdom. And we thank you, Father God, just for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us. So we are reminded in the scriptures that Christ in us is the hope of glory. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit who is dwelling within us and is empowering us to continue the work that you have begun in your son and through the apostles. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. It is such an awesome um, honor every time that I'm able to stand before you and just give you the word of God. Um, it's such an awesome, it's a privilege, honestly. Um, you know, when I think of those who came before me, I think of the apostles, you know, and I think of the early church fathers, and I think of the various preachers and the various teachers of the faith. Um, and even our father um, and, you know, our, our, our spiritual parents and Pastor Ben Coley and, and Sharon Akimola, just thank you for the, just very thankful to, for the opportunity just to be a part of the work of God. Um, this message that I am bringing tonight is, uh, is really, a, it's a continuation, um, or really is a, is a it's, 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 Part of what I've taught on this past Saturday um, in our men's fellowship, and this is just an encouragement to all the men in our um, church, you know, that, hey, you know, if you can, please be a part of our early Saturday morning prayers because everything that, you know, that we are doing is all connected, and this message was a message that I prepared for them, but, you know, God has just prompted in my spirit to begin to share it again. Um, as a result of what took place um, in that fellowship. And also, um, just want to let you know that we, we launched uh, Grace Groups on the 31st of January of this year. And um, so if you are looking to be a part of Grace Groups or um, you want to know more about Grace Groups or you want someone to contact you in relation in, in, in concerning Grace Groups, um, Please just reach reach out to us by email. Um, the email address is Grace Groups. That's with an S at WalkFanUSA.org. Again, that is Grace Groups with an S at WalkFanUSA.org, and we would be more than happy um, to get in touch with you in that regard. Um, let's turn to John, the Book of John, Gospel of John. Whichever one makes you, uh, which one one suits you. <laughs> Gospel of the uh, Gospel of John, Book of John, chapter ten, and we're going to read from verse thirty to thirty-six. The Book of John, chapter ten, verse thirty to thirty-six, and I'm reading from the NASB. Um, Whatever version you have, that's fine. It should all say the same thing just about. Um, and we're just starting for verse um, 30. So this is John chapter 10, verse 30. It says, I and the Father are one. This is Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ speaking. He says, I and the Father are one. Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Verse 32, Yeshua answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father, uh, for which of them are you stoning me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because, be, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Verse 34, Yeshua answered them, has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? Verse 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of them who, do you say of him,
whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Amen. And that's going to be our scriptural focus for this evening. So, you know, unbelievers, um, they don't have a problem with religion or religions. They don't have a problem with spirituality. Matter of fact, just claiming to be a Christian does not present a problem to Muslims, to Jews, to Buddhists, to Hindus. Unbelievers expect that you believe in something. Just, you know, uh, just yesterday, uh, one of my uh, poetry friends in, uh, in, in Houston um, just put out on Facebook that, you know, that she is now joining uh, the Yoruba religion, uh, you know, or, uh, and I don't really understand all that is involved in that, but, you know, um, she's um, acquainted herself with Yoruba priestess and wanted to now learn to, you know, be a part of the Yoruba faith. And for those who are Yoruba, you can please explain that to me a little bit more because I don't know a lot about it. But, you know, she put on all these garbs and stuff and, and I guess she's going through the ceremonial ritual. Um, this young lady who I'm speaking of, me and her have had dialogues about Christianity and um, she used to be a part of the church. You know, her mother served in the church, she served in the church. And she was, um, as a result of church hurt, she left the church. Um, and in our dialogues, I mean, one time we had an extensive conversation. It must have been maybe about an hour, an hour and a half that we talked about the faith. And her response to me is that it was a white man that wrote, you know, that wrote the Bible. And, you know, and she didn't want, you know, she didn't want to have anything to do with it. But... As she was proclaiming that what I was believing in was a myth, she herself didn't have a problem going to another myth. <laughs> so unbelievers, they don't have a problem with religion or spirituality. Everybody's expecting that you believe in something. So, but one of the things that most people wish that they could do is avoid having a discussion about religions. If we could avoid discussing our faiths, then we would be able to have more friends, build more relationships, business ventures, and the walls of division would be torn down. However, for us as believers in Christ, our identity as a people of the kingdom is not hinged on myths. It's not hinged on Fables. It's hinged on a historical person who actually exists, who actually walked and talked with men, and who had a direct connection to the Father. It is on the person of Jesus Christ. And, and what we read in, in John chapter 10 is a dialogue between the Messiah and the Jewish leadership. What took place earlier is that Yeshua healed a man on the Sabbath, and Jewish leaders are now questioning Yeshua as to who gave him the right to heal, especially on the Sabbath. It's like I'm hearing an echo. Now note that Yeshua had just healed a blind man, um, and please understand that when Yeshua healed people of their disease, it was to affirm that he is indeed the Messiah. And they understood from, their, uh, from the Old Testament, um, for they, they understood from their, their law and their prophets that when blind eyes were open, that this was an indication that the Messianic age was now upon them. This was an indication that the kingdom of God has now arrived. And so therefore, when Jesus was healing people, when he went about and healed people of the various infirmities that they had, no matter what the disease may be, specifically of blindness, they knew that, okay, something that God has promised is now coming to fruition. 
And I would uh, encourage you to read chapter 9 up until this point in John chapter 10 to get a little bit more of a contextual understanding of the discussion. But I cannot go into heavy detail for the sake of time, but to, to fast forward, Yeshua identifies himself as the Son of God who is in union with the Father to, I guess in a sense, to knock down um, uh, 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 a, a false doctrine that has, uh, that has kind of uh, crept into the church. Jesus is not the Father. And we have to be very clear. Jesus is not the Father. He is in union with the Father. He is the Son. As he said in John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. If you was reading this in the, in the literal Greek, it would say, I and the Father, we are one. Yeshua identifies himself as the Son of God who is in union with the Father. And if you understand anything about biblical Jewish people, understand that they did not play with Yahweh. Yahweh was off limits. Out of the sense of commitment to the law, Moses claiming equality with Yahweh demands the death penalty. Understand that for the people who lived at that time, all they knew concerning Yahweh was based on the law, which was their highest form of knowledge. Nothing was greater than the law except God himself. Now here comes a construction worker, a carpenter, a day laborer like the, like the illegal immigrants that you would see that would stand in front of Home Depot looking for an opportunity to work. Here comes one who looks like them just based off of the appearance and his status, who does not rank very high on the, on the social ladder, claiming to be greater than Moses by offering a better revelation of Yahweh. Now that should really just blow your mind. Not only did he just break the Sabbath traditions by healing people, but he also was claiming to be God himself. And now they were seeking to kill him, and Yeshua does something that is masterful. He talks about his works because his works are connected to his identity. He says in, in verse 31, I showed you many good works from the Father, from, for which of them are you stoning me? This is a good time for me to, to take a pause and to ask you as, as brothers and, and sisters, um, are, you, are your works consistent with your relationship with the Father? When you are on the job and, and you claim to have a relationship with the Father as a believer in Messiah Yeshua, is there consistency between your identity in Christ and the works that you produce? What about at home with your family? Can your spouse affirm that you, are, that, that you are of the faith based on how you treat them? Is your actions a, a demonstration of, of God's law to your children, of God's love, rather, to your children? How about with fellow members in the congregation? Is our identity as children of the Most High God evident in how we correspond with one another? Because how we live and, and interact with our, our brothers and sisters in the community at large is flowing directly from our identity in Christ. Yes, we are saved by grace, not of works, but our works should flow from our identity. Inward to outward, our horizontal interaction, our horizontal fellowship with God should impact our, I'm sorry, our vertical interaction, our, our vertical fr fellowship with God from, from us worshiping God, from us dialoguing with God, from us uh, praying should have an impact on our horizontal relationships, how we relate to the people who are in our oil coast, our fellowships, on the job. It should come as a result of, of our relationship with God. 
Many times we quote that we are saved by grace, but we also must connect with this succeeding passage which points to our grace-based responsibility. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Real quick, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, not every, as a result of work so that no one may boast. There's nothing that I can do to have earned the grace of God. It is the grace of God. There's nothing that I could have done to earn salvation freely given to me by God himself. You know, we always ask people, you know, did you, when did you um, accept Jesus Christ? Like, when did you um, come to know Jesus Christ? You know, how did you come to, when did you give your life to Jesus Christ? And the real question should be, when did Jesus meet you? When did Jesus reveal himself to you? That's what happened to the Apostle Paul who wrote this passage. He was on his way to murder, uh, uh, murder Christians, and Jesus met him. He wasn't looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him and encountered him. And since then, the Apostle Paul's life has radically changed. This was a devout Jew. He was a devout Pharisee. He knew the scriptures and yet his encounter with Christ changed his entire outlook. So we were, we're saved by grace, not as a result of us looking for God, but as a result of God looking for us. Not that we earned it. We didn't work for this salvation. God gave it to us freely. But then verse 10 states our responsibility, our grace based responsibility. Verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The good works in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 is the same good works that Yeshua mentioned in John chapter 10 verse 32. The word good comes from the, the Greek word kalos, K-A-L-O-S, meaning to meet high standards or expectations of appearance, kind, or quality. In other words, these good works represented the character of the Father. They were noble. This is different from, this is different from performing a level of excellence like getting a 100 on a test. This is different from doing a job void of mistakes or perfect in the context of human performance. It means that that, that job in itself reflects who God is. It's liberating. It brings life. It's, it's the laying on hands on the sick that they would recover. It is praying for those who are sick that they would be healed. It is praying for those who are in need that they may have uh, have connections to the resources that God would make available to them. It is preaching salvation to a dying world. It is supporting missionary efforts. It is feeding those who are currently in need of food. You know, last Sunday we talked about uh, financial freedom and, 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 and stewardship. And the question that arose was, you know, is there, is, is, is there um, a, a contrast between me giving um, or should there be a, should, should my giving impact my ability to invest? And, and, and Dr. D put it nicely. What God has given you, what God has blessed you with is a means by which you can bless the, the church and, and bless the mission that God has called the church to do. 
it's an honor towards God. And, and in this honor, we're able to meet the needs of those who are in the, uh, in the global community and even in our local community. Here at our service, we are, uh, at our church, we also have um, this uh, thing called Love Outreach Missions, where we are involved in, in meeting the needs of the community through, um, through our food pantry. At a time of need, people are able to encounter the love of God by just coming to our food pantry and receiving something that is free. These, these works represent the character of the Father. This is what I call the job behind the job. I think about Superman, who is like one of my favorite superheroes. Superman is, in his nine to five, is a journalist. <laughs> he works at a journalist, as a journalist for this company called The Daily Planet. This is the job that pays the bills. This is where he earns his paycheck. However, Superman would use his position as a journalist as a means to assess the needs of the society that he is in. He knows where the needs are because his job keeps him in tune with the everyday citizen. His job on the surface is just the job, but beneath the surface, his job provides the avenue by which he can minister to his city. In closing, I want to highlight uh, the late sister Bobby Jean Moore, who died of cancer a couple of years back. Sister Bobby Jean was my youth pastor when we first attended Walt Fan. Sister Bobby Jean was a spirit-filled, spirit-led uh, middle school teacher. Every morning before her children would come into the classroom, Sister Bobby Jean would, pl pr would pray over her classroom. She would pray over the seats that the, that the students would come in and they would sit. And what was interesting is that the characteristics of the students, uh, the characters that the students would display when they came into her class was remarkably, remarkably different from how they interacted when they went into other classrooms. In other words, when they came into her classroom, the, the presence of God was made manifest in the attitude of the students. Sister Bobby Jean dressed up like a teacher, but underneath, she was an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and she would find means to communicate to the students that she was interacting with. She would find means to communicate to them the gospel. She touched the hearts of every child that came into her classroom and she was an unsung hero of the faith. Good works. By God's grace, I'll be able to continue further uh, next week, Wednesday, if God allows. But just want to go ahead and pray and uh, close out the service for today. Father God, we just want to thank you for just an opportunity to just engage your word. We pray, Father God, that it touches someone, someone out there that needs to know of your goodness, know who you are, and that we thank you, Father God, because of your son. And we pray, Father God, that, this, that what they heard today will be a life-changing message. We just glorify you, we give you the praise, and we give you, we give you the honor. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your time, and look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to abide with you until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful evening. God bless.